Good morning. My name is Mark Shklov and welcome to Law Across the Sea. I'm the host of Law Across the Sea. Uh, and today we had a little bit of a uh, delay getting into the studio here at Think Tech. Uh, we got locked out. Our keys did not work. Uh, the keys to the door would not turn. So we were uh, a little bit delayed, but uh, maybe that's good because uh, sometimes uh, being on time is, doesn't give you time to think about what you're going to talk about. And today we're going to talk, uh, the, the, the theme of our program is soul of the law. And it's spelled a little bit differently. It, soul of the law can be two things. It can be a place in Korea, a city, capital, very vibrant place to live. And it can also be a spirit, a uh, soul, a different spelling perhaps, but uh, you have two meanings. And we're going to talk a little bit about both meanings here today. Uh, my guests are Elizabeth Lee and John Ree. They are lawyers in Honolulu. Uh, welcome. Good to see you both. Uh, Thank you, Mike. It's great to be here. Elizabeth is a lawyer with Goodsell Anderson, Quinn and Stifel. Uh, John is a lawyer with Alston Hunt, Floyd and Ng. Uh, both have been practicing here in Hawaii for a while. And the, the soul of the law theme that, uh, that's my title, I'll take the blame for it, uh, comes up because you were both born in Korea uh, and you lived there for a while. But then as young children, you moved to the United States uh, and ultimately became attorneys practicing here in Hawaii. I want to learn a little bit about your background and what the culture of Korea has meant to uh, your growing up and becoming lawyers and your practice of law. In my mind, I think your background, where you were born, is something you keep with you all your life. And even though you may pass the bar, and have all these degrees, mm -hmm. really the depth of your culture and your knowledge of your background and your history, you carry that with you everywhere. And you talk to people about it, you talk to clients and other attorneys, and it's meaningful. It's sometimes more meaningful than that law degree. People don't ask you about the law degree on the wall, but they do ask you about your, your background, your, your culture, where you were born. So I'd like you to both tell me a little bit about yourselves, where you, know, where you were born, how you came to the United States, and uh, became lawyers. Um, actually, that it's interesting your introductory comments because my father would say um, while I was growing up, if you died a thousand times, you would be reborn Korean a thousand times. You mm. can't change that. Um, so I think um, I think you're you're right. Um, so my family immigrated to Hawaii when I was seven, um, and um, primarily I think their reason for coming here uh, was for education because my parents wanted us to have a lot of different educational opportunities. Um, and my father had um, spent a few years at East West Center at UH. Um, and so he got to know Hawaii, and I think he, he fell in love with Hawaii, and he thought, okay, this would be a good place. Um, and uh, it just happened that, um, you know, it was, a, at that time, the immigration policies were such that, you know, we had a great-granduncle who could sponsor us, our family, to come. Um, and so, you know, that's how we, we came to be here. Okay. And, and piggybacking off of Elizabeth's comments, I think that first wave entailed largely, um, you know, educated professionals because there were certain preferences in the immigration laws. So my parents, probably in, in similar fashion, you know, immigrated over here. I immigrated to, we all immigrated to the East Coast when I was about three and a half, um, was raised on the East Coast, and we found our way, my wife and I and our daughter found our way here about five years ago, um, and that was largely because of our respective careers. Um, we've got a position at Alston Hunt, and my wife is teaching at UH Manoa. Um, but Koreanness, um, I think, is certainly very embedded in our identities, in our cultures, 
And I think it seeps into our careers probably in varying fashions. You know, for me, um, it's certainly a more personal aspect of my life than in a day-to-day -day work environment. Um, not many of my clients are Korean, and my Korean right now is probably a little worse than my daughter's. But it's still a, bar a large part of my identity, and I'm sure Elizabeth can elaborate in terms of the intersection of Koreanness and, and um, her career well, as well. You, you were born in Korea. I was. Where were you born? I was born in Seoul. And, and were you also born in, in no, Seoul? No, actually our family is from Cheongju, Cheongju which is okay. about an hour and a half outside of Seoul. Okay. It's more of a, the suburb. Um, and um, my grandparents had a farm. Shigol means, you know, the countryside. Shigol? Shigol. And um, so we spent a lot of time, you know, uh, in the countryside. And my father tells stories of how he would have to walk three miles in the snow to get to school from, from the farm. And they're true. <laughs> and they're true. <laughs> well, you know, and I like what you talk about your father very much because I, I had the same experience. My father uh, uh, was born in, in China uh, and came to Canada, and that's where I was born eventually. But he, you know, we, he did share that background. So in, in your background, education. Right. I, I mean, I, I hear I hear that, and I think we're, we'll talk more about that. But I mm -hmm. hear education as being kind of the driving force in bringing you right. here. Right. So my father was a, a university professor in economics in Korea at Cheongju University. Um, so he was well aware of the educational opportunities, both you know growing up through you know your primary schooling, uh, middle school, high school, and then just the rigors of getting into a university. Um, and I think. There are probably more opportunities now and more options, but back then, you know, I don't think there were that many um, university options. And so, comparing that to the universities in the U.S., he thought, well, you know, <laughs> um, let's give our children that opportunity. And, um, and was, is that? Would you say that's like a a a, a Korean ideal? Is is this giving I, the children and it's and and you know all children? Mm -hmm. Right. I think certainly in, you know, many Asian cultures, children come first in the family. Um, my husband loves to say how he's the low man on the totem pole, <laughs> and our, I have a son who's 14. Um, and I think education um, and school issues, schooling, that, I mean, that happened, that's priority. I mean, that takes priority. And that's priority. something you, I hear now that culturally, right. Korean, and right. that's something you currently still practice right. in your own American yes. life. Right, okay? right. Now, John, you, you, you said you, you landed on the East Coast. I did, yes. Okay, where, where on the East Coast? Um, I grew up largely in New Jersey. Okay, all right. Yeah. That's why I detect that accent, that New Jersey accent. So what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and, and you, you, you both speak some Korean. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, you're, you're fluent, Elizabeth, as I Fairly understand. Fairly fluent, yes. And do you have much occasion to continue to, to, to use the Korean language, or...? Um, well, you know, when I, um, when I meet prospective clients um, from Korea or, you know, Korea-based um, companies, um, I think even though their English is very good, um, many of the Korean business folks in Korea um, were educated in the U.S. or yes. have some education. So their English is very good. And growing up from, I think, kindergartners today go to English, you know. Um, in Korea. In right. Korea. They're called hagwons, and it's like a study, you know, like a Kaplan kind of, you know, place. So their English is very good. But I think when I meet um, Korean business folks, potential clients, I speak to them in Korean out of respect. It's a show of respect. Um, I think if I were to just speak English and be very Western and say, hey, Mark, how are you? Good to meet you. Um, I think I might come across a little rude and maybe kind of you know, arrogant. Um, so as a sign of respect, I will you know, abide by the Korean customs that they're used to in Korea. I mean, I think they appreciate that. And, and John, your your practice, uh, you you said you're mostly uh, you mostly don't deal with Korean clients. That's and, right. And how? But how how does that affect? I mean, in, in your do you, what what do you bring to those relationships from Korea? Yeah. In, in your mind. Well, I might have to lie down on a couch for this one. <laughs> I, I I think that it it affects 
our identity and everything that we do. So that when the two biggest examples that come to mind would be those our interactions on behalf of the HSBA, Hawaii State Bar Association, and the Seoul Bar Association. So that there are those times when we get together as attorneys, as people who are just interested in these issues, and get to meet Korean attorneys. So it doesn't necessarily mean clients and business per se, but as, as we all probably know, we're in a line of work that's based on relationships. And mm -hmm. even if, let's say, I'm not exactly fluent, a certain core knowledge of culture, of, of you know, our respective cultures and histories and countries does go a long way and does help. And um, let me ask you, just from your Korean background, if it's true, is there a, is there a reason you became attorneys that is, is Korean based or, or might have, have influenced you culturally? from Korea? I'll say this, the Ree family dining room table was <laughs> not the breeding ground for litigators because it was pretty conservative, the chill, we were pretty quiet, so this was not, and I'm certainly not blaming my parents or anything for that, but does culture have, did it affect me? I think it affected not necessarily my litigation skills, but my appreciation for, let's say, law and its effect on society because you know, we all immigrated at a time when Korea was still, let's say, a military dictatorship. It was a market democracy was on its way. But this is a test case for that transition towards a civil society. And my parents and I didn't necessarily talk about it a lot, but certainly it was on my mind growing up, right. this civic engagement and the, how law has an impact on society. How about you, Elizabeth? I mean, I, I, you know, what John says is that there's, this may not have been verbalized, but there, there's something culturally and in your background that may have made law something you thought about. I think for me, um, my response is not as intellectual as John's. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have two points. I mean, one, um, in Korean language, in the vocabulary, um, many of the professions um, end with the, the syllable sa. sa. So it's piano sa, that's attorney. Mm -hmm. Uza is doctor. Um, uh, um, okay, I'm drawing a blank now, but um, you know, so those are the favored professions. So professional degrees, right? Doctor, lawyer, professor. Um, and actually, moksa, which is pastor, because you know they right, respect um, pastors. Um, so that was stressed in our family. Um, and the saw, the saw. Yeah, we right. Like you want to be right, exactly yeah. have a profession yeah. that ends with that. Um, and so, practically speaking, I mean, growing up, even though I grew up here in the U.S., I didn't know you could be a chef. I didn't know that you could have a career <laughs> yeah. as a salesperson. I didn't yeah. know there was such thing as a school nurse. Um, you I know, those are all things that I would have loved to, have I yeah. mean, you know, marketing, you know, be a marketing person. Um, yeah. For me, it was either you were going to go into law or medicine, um, and yeah. my math skills weren't good enough, so, you know. But a lot, sort of similar to what John was saying, though, but once I decided, and I decided early on, like, I, I think in middle school, that I wanted to be a lawyer, um, I think that experiencing some prejudice, some inequality, some of the issues that we face as immigrants, um, I think that affected me in terms of, you know, the advocacy aspect of being a lawyer and knowing things that the average person may not know about one's rights. Um, I think that probably played a big factor. Uh, uh, right? Can I just yeah. add, I agree with you so much in terms of the explicit and maybe implicit expectations of parents because you're right. I mean, it's um, doctors, lawyers, professors, and that goes hand in hand with this emphasis on education and mm -hmm. trying to achieve. I don't see many, um, like recently when, when um, Aziz Ansari and Alan Yang won an Emmy, Alan Yang in his um, acceptance speech said, you know, Asian parents out there, if you could give your <laughs> children fewer violins and more cameras, you know, it was quite telling. I think that, I think our generation would probably tell our kids to be, try being an entrepreneur. Right. But I don't think our parents would have told us, you know, 
go ahead in the garage and tinker with whatever, you know? It's doctors and lawyers. Well, uh, and I hear that comes from both of you as a perhaps a Korean cultural push from right. your parents. And w I want to talk a little bit after our break about yeah. where we go from there, where you go from there, what your thoughts are about Korea today. Mm -hmm. Okay? Okay. So we'll take a brief break and then come back with Elizabeth and John. Hello, my name is Crystal. Let me tell you, my talk show, I'm all about health. It's healthy to talk about sex. It's healthy to talk about things that people don't talk about. It's healthy to discuss things that you think are unhealthy because you need to talk about it. So I welcome you to watch Quok Talk and engage in some provocative discussions on things that do relate to healthy issues and have a well-balanced attitude in life. Join me. Hey, Stan the Energy Man here. I know you're bored this summer. You're just sitting at home, figuring out what to do, go to the beach, spend some time with Think Tech Hawaii. Spend the time thinking about how you can contribute to Hawaii and making it a better place to live. And start watching some of the programs on Think Tech, including Stan the Energy Man, where you'll learn all about everything energy, especially hydrogen and transportation. So we'll see you every Friday at 12 o'clock noon. Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Thank you for watching Think Tech. I'm Grace Chang, the new host for Global Connections. You can find me here live every Thursday at 1 p.m. where we'll be talking to people around the islands or visiting the islands who are connected in various aspects of global affairs. So please tune in and aloha and thanks for watching. program is Soul of Law, and we have Elizabeth Lee and John Ree uh, talking about, uh, well, growing up Korean in a way, uh, although that wasn't really our, our uh, theme, but a lot of it does play into being attorneys, right? I mean, uh, that Korean cultural background, the education, the push for education, and uh, the, the, the SA, I want you, I mean, I want my daughter, I want my son to be these esteemed professionals who have that last part of the, the title that in Korean is so important. And I see how that has formed your present beliefs uh, also about where you go forward with your own families. And just before we go into investment uh, from Korea, what how has that, how, how have you reacted to that uh, um, going forward with your, own, with your own children? How does the Korean culture play into that? Or, or what part do you take and leave behind? Or what part do you emphasize? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, um, you know, people wonder why the LPGA is dominated by Korean female golfers. Um, and, you know, I think that the simple answer is they work very hard. I mean, you know, the work ethic, you can't beat that. Um, I remember my first job out of law school, I, I was with a firm in Seattle, and back then we would still, you know, do research with real books in yeah, the library. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the library uh, was right outside the senior partner's office, and I'd be standing there doing my research. And he would see me when he came in in the morning, and then he would see me there when he left at night. And he asked me, do you ever go home? You know, do you ever, you know, um, leave the firm? And I said, you know, I was always taught to be here before my boss right. and be the last to leave. You right. know, so you never leave your job so before you're, your boss you're, leaves. You're not boasting. No, no. You are no, telling just, what was your mm -hmm. cultural background. Right, it was just natural for me. And if I did anything less, I felt like I wasn't doing a good job. Um, and I think even though my parents didn't sit me down and say, okay, these are the rules. Once you start working, this is how you behave. But just over time at dinner conversations yeah. or talking learn. about this and that, you learn these different values yeah. that translate to how you behave. Um, and I think that the Korean work ethic is unbeatable in terms of, you know, I mean, incomparable um, to others. And um, I think that plays a big factor in the way that, you know, I work as an attorney. And one thing that we mentioned just during the commercial break, because Mark, you talked about the next generation or going forward, you know, 
I don't think our respective families would have valued, let's say, the person who dropped out of you know, undergrad at Harvard and started a, a software company. So there, is, there are those aspects where I think we're more comfortable telling our kids to be entrepreneurs, to pursue certain projects. And speaking for myself, um, I, my family probably didn't espouse the virtue of the greasy wheel gets the oil. Um, and that's one thing that I see that is so important. It's good to debate. It's good to question. And that's something that I try to instill in my daughter. So going forward, I do think that there would be more, since we're here in the States, on individuality and entrepreneurism. And so now we're kind of seeing maybe the best of both worlds. We're seeing a, a Korean culture and American culture coming together. And you're, you're combining them and moving forward with your own, your own children into something that, that you personally believe is better and, um, or, or more appropriate. Let's put it that way. Well, I'm pretty strict with my son still, though. <laughs> um, and, um, and he has these you know, discussions with his friends at school as to whose mom is scarier. <laughs> um, and so he has a couple friends whose uh, parents are also from Korea. Um, but they're a different immigrant than my parents were in I that, see. you know, they immigrated here because they have money um, and, you know, it's just what they choose to do that's a little different than, you know, back in the 70s. Yeah. But, you know, he talks about, you know, well, my mom's pretty scary because she'll get upset if I don't get the A+. Plus. Like, if there's an option for A+, plus and I get an A, a, show, right? yeah. you know, I... I Tiger mean, mom. Right, I mean, <laughs> you know, and it's, and it's not that I'm, I'm so much a tiger mom as I think that what I still carry over from my culture and from my parents is that you don't want to waste any of your talents, God-given talents. You don't want to... Um, you want to maximize, you know, what you can do. Um, I think the difference may be... In my generation, it was like, use your talents to maximize it for yourself. But I think what my husband and I try to instill in our child is, use your talents to maximize the good for others. Yeah. Um, and I think that concept of serving and being more community-minded and being able to have the ability to be outward um, in your ambitions um, to benefit others, that's a new concept. That's uh, uh, new to our generation. Can I just sh yeah, share yeah. one related anecdote, and this might segue towards um, kind of investments in Hawaii and right. so on. My wife and I had a parent-teacher night several years ago, um, um, and there was one woman, who, a Korean lady, who approached my wife, and they hadn't seen each other in over 20 years. Um, they had known each other in middle school, and um, my wife's friend came here from Korea with her children, and that was specifically for the issue of education um, and conferring upon the next generation that so, education so skill is, set. Is, I mean, is that what we should expect from Korea now as far as investment? Is that, is that what you're saying, John? Is that, is, that, is, that, is that the field that we should be promoting here in Hawaii? I mean, my, my question to both of you is what is coming in from Korea? What's the, what do you see? you know, in your practices or in, in life in general or your, from your relatives or friends, what do you see from the Korean uh, country coming mm -hmm. into Hawaii as investment? Because we're, we're interested in promoting Hawaii, too. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know if we should expect a massive tide of Korean parents wanting to send their kids to private schools, but I do think that's indicative of where Hawaii sits in the imagination of, of Koreans. One, there's Obama, and uh, everyone apparently knows that Obama went to Punahou uh, and grew up here. So there is that aspect. I still think that Hawaii features prominently as kind of a resort paradise. Um, and lastly, it has a unique ma state mandate with respect to renewable energy. So to the extent that the government, as well as larger companies, want to seek investments and in research and test cases in renewable energy, that remains an open niche market, I think, with potential. I think we can be um, 
I think we can be more creative here in Hawaii. I mean, we're not New York, LA. Um, you know, we don't have these, you know, 30, 50, you know, million dollar deals um, for these big Korean companies to do. But I think Hawaii is attractive to South Koreans um, as well as to a lot of folks in Asia, right? Um, and I think that business folks uh, want to do business where they like to travel to. Um, and so if we can be more creative in terms of trying to attract more Korean companies to do business here in Hawaii, um, you know, I think that's, that's where the future is. Um, so for example, I was talking to someone and um, I, I don't do much in the entertainment field or, or, or in movies, but Hawaii is a great place for, you know, scenes and K-drama, yeah. right? I yeah. mean, you know, yeah. the, the, you know, um, you know, in, in Korean drama, I don't know if you see much of it, but well, you know, that one yes, kiss, my, right? I mean, the <laughs> one kiss is just so pivotal in, in the scene and to do that, um, you know, on the sandy beaches of Hawaii, that would be amazing. But my understanding is it can be kind of difficult to shoot here um, because of the cost. Um, and there are other, you know, barriers currently that prevent, you know, these filming companies from Korea uh, coming here to shoot. But I think that would be one area that we That's could probably, a good idea. Yeah, um, I like you know, that a lot. and um, and also, it, it you know, sense. <laughs> yeah, I, I, and definitely, um, I see um, the older Korean, I mean, older South Koreans, where like the folks who are over seventy or like in their eighties. I think people. Um, want to be able to leave Korea if something were to happen with North Korea. And so they're slowly moving a little bit of their, you know, assets over to Hawaii, just um, slow a, a little bit okay. at a time so and that exodus. if they, right, so I if hear. they need to leave, then they've got money sitting here. Um, and so they're buying real, real estate for themselves, maybe not like these big deals, but can I can yeah, raise yeah, one yeah. point? And I think what you mentioned about K-drama is, is important because it's not, there was a certain um, government institutional role in the growth of K-drama and K-pop. Um, one well-known, I think a, a well-known saying in the 90s was that the profits from Jurassic Park outnumbered all the profits from an X number, a huge number of Hyundai automobiles. And there was a government push to engage in soft power and to develop the industry to export, you know, culture, music, and dramas, um, because it is it has become a significant economic factor. So, to the extent that the Hawaiian government or other players can be strategic to reach out and say, here are some economic incentives mm -hmm. to, you know, film here or to create music here or culture to have bands perform here. There's so much potential, I think. One, one final question that I'd like each of you to give me a, a, an answer to is, uh, you know, and you kind of brought it up, Elizabeth, is that uh, South Korea sits on the border with North Korea. And, and I've been in Seoul, and it's like, so what? what, what what's the cultural background to that, or the philosophy? What makes Koreans so cool? Well, I think it's just that they've lived with that threat for a long time. Um, and, you know, when I was in Korea last year, I mean, I talked to cab drivers, I talked to people at Starbucks, you know, just the local residents, and I was just surprised, you know, how close the Incheon Airport <laughs> is to the border. Um, and I think most people, most young folks that haven't lived through that, you know, war-torn, you know, situation, I think they're just, you know, they just don't really see it as a real threat. John, briefly? Uh, I agree. Um, they've been technically in a state of war for the past 50, 60 years, I think, so that when you live with it every day, you know, what are, what are they going to, what are, what are the choices? We're just going to get up and leave? I guess if people have the money, they will make those contingencies. But for the vast majority of the folks there, they will go about with everyday life. So that when I speak to my in-laws, I'm not really asking the question of, so when are you coming over? <laughs> Stuff like that. Well, you know, and, and that's good. I mean, that helps us too in our own lives is, is learning how to live with that type of stress. And I want to thank you both. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. It was fun. Today.